good day. So, today uh, we will start uh, our discussion on data link layer. As a matter of fact, uh, we have already discussed a part of the data link layer namely the MAC sub layer and we will see how uh, that all fits in. But to fit it into the broader picture, if you remember when we were discussing the 7 layer OSI protocol uh, starting from the application layer, the bottom most layer was the physical layer. So, we have finished our discussion on physical layer and just above the physical layer we have the data link layer. So, we, we will look at the different components of data link layer and how they are used and we will look at a few protocols etcetera. So, that is what we will do. <coughs> so, our main this thing is data link protocols which are the protocols which are used in the data link layer. Now, what are the main tasks of data link layer? It transfers data from the network layer of one machine to the network layer of another machine. So, uh, uh, the actually this is the part of the service it gives to the upper layer. You remember that above the data link layer we have the network layer alright. Uh, so, uh, below the network layer we have the data link layer. So, the data link layer gives some service to the network layer and this service is the transfer of data uh, from one network layer to another network layer. So, that is the service it gives to the network layer and this in its turn uses the physical layer. So, it converts raw bit stream of the physical layer into groups of bits etcetera or frames. So, uh, this is how we can look at it. Uh, so, this is one node and this is another node. Um, above this of course, there may be other layers. <coughs> we are not concerned about these upper layers at the moment. So, this gets uh, some data to be sent from the network layer and this data link layer sends it to the next data link layer. Remember once again that the network layer is concerned with uh, transfer of data etcetera across the network. That means, it may take several such hops, but data link layer is just concerned with a single hop. So, this is how we simplify the problem, the problem of going multi hop. Um, uh, so, this multi hop part we leave it to the network layer for this single hop. Uh, so, multi hop naturally will constitute a number of such single hops and data link layer uh, would uh, handle the transfer of data from one uh, uh, from one node to the next one hop. So, actually this is another way of looking at it uh, because for the um, there is a virtual uh, data path from layer 3 to layer 3 but actually this goes through the data link layer and this is the actual data path which goes through the physical layer and some physical transmission medium. Now, why do we require uh, any kind of uh, control in the data link? Uh, these are the main points or which these are the main functions of the data link uh, um, layer. So, <coughs> actually not all of them or not all combinations are uh, used in all situations, but these are the general uh, sort of categorization of the kind of thing that we would be concerned with in data link layer. One is frame synchronization. That means, when you are uh, the beginning and the end of a uh, data block called frame should be recognizable alright. That means, when you are sending a number of um, bytes let us say from one machine to the other. Uh, so, uh, so, they are sort of uh, grouped into let us say some blocks. So, the on the other side uh, the, they should be able to recognize that okay, this is the beginning of the block and this is the end of the block. Okay. So, for that you need required to uh, organize the um, uh, these bytes into some uh, what are called frames. So, we will look at details of frames later on. So, that is the first job of data link layer. Second link, uh, job of data link layer which it might do or might not do in some cases, but anyway one of the things that it do, does sometimes is flow control. This sender should not send frames at a rate faster than the receiver can receive and process them. This is important okay? because if the uh, because the sender may not know everything about the state of the receiver at that particular point of time. Okay. So, if it keeps on sending data which overwhelms the receiver, so the receiver will be forced to drop some of that data. <coughs> so, in some cases uh, uh, this is ignored, 
uh, or in some cases this is not relevant, but in some cases these are very relevant and the data link layer may do some flow control. Secondly, error con thirdly rather error control any bit errors introduced by the transmission system should be corrected. This is important that um, hmm, uh, whenever you are so, uh, sort of uh, sending some uh, something through a transmission medium, there is always some uh, chance of errors and uh, the data link layer has to take care of this error upon that particular link. We will come to this say one second. Next is addressing on a multi point link like LAN, uh, the identity that means uh, suppose there is a LAN which is hanging from a bus or something, the identity of sender and receiver must be specified okay? and the identity in such a case the identity of the receiver uh, would be very important because in many such links and especially broadcast links what happens is whatever you send uh, reaches everybody. Now the receiving station must know that uh, whether or not this particular uh, frame is meant for him. So, uh, the receiver uh, the address of the receiver is important. So, addressing this is another issue and this is a data link layer kind of address we will come to that later on. Now, uh, now for whatever for all this uh, error control flow control uh, may be etcetera. So, we require some protocol some data link layer protocol to run between the two layers alright. So, for uh, the in order for this protocol to run actually uh, these two nodes need to exchange some uh, control or management information okay. otherwise their protocol cannot run at that level. Uh, but, uh, but how will this uh, control or management information uh, go from one machine to the other how will they interchange once again through the same medium alright. So, control and data on the same link so control and data will flow on the same link the receiver must be able to distinguish control information from the data being transmitted. Then we require some link management procedures for the management of the initiation, maintenance and termination of a sustained data exchange. So, these are the different functions of the uh, data link la layer. So, far as uh, services if you look at the same thing uh, from the services angle what kind of services uh, it gives uh, like it gives framing and link access. So, encapsulates datagram into frame adding header or trailer. Okay, we will look at these headers and trailers these are dependent what kind of headers what do they contain etcetera that depends on the particular protocol that you are using on that link. Um, sometimes some of them do not have any trailer so only header some of them have both header and trailer and this is uh, the part which is used for the uh, protocol to run. Channel access is shared medium we have already seen a number of such cases uh, the so called MAC protocols. So, that is also a part of this if it is a shared medium then the medium access control has to be uh, used and then the addresses if there are uh, multiple receivers. So, these are the so called MAC addresses used in frame headers to identify source destination. This is different from another address we have over the entire network which is called an IP address. Uh, so, we are now we will be looking at IP address later on when we talk after we talk about network layer, but right now the addresses we would be considering are the MAC addresses also known as hardware addresses. Link layer services other services is that it is reliable delivery between adjacent nodes. So, for reliable uh, delivery, uh, so we may need to something depending on uh, the quality of your link alright. If the uh, quality of your link is uh, very good like say some uh, good quality fiber etcetera uh, you may not uh, need to do much. Okay. But then there are media uh, which uh, essentially are very prone to noise or very prone to uh, introduction of uh, all kinds of errors. Uh, so, in such cases you, the data link layer has to take special care uh, so that the transmission over this particular link is reliable alright. Apart from this particular link uh, uh, you may still require some kind of uh, resilience at a higher level because some particular node in between at a network layer if you are when you are talking about the entire network at some particular node in between the node might fail. So, whatever protocol you might be having for data link layer etcetera for making it very sturdy it will not work. So, the chain will sort of break down, but this is to make individual links of the chain 
uh, as good as possible so far as errors are concerned. So, this is one job of the reliable data on the delivery. Uh, so, uh, just as fiber etcetera may have low error bits similarly some links like wireless links have high error bits. Why both link level and end to end reliability? So, this we have just discussed. Then flow control as we were saying pacing between adjacent sending and receiving nodes. So, they sort of must be able um, should be in sync that means, uh, whatever the sending station sends and the receiving station should be able to absorb that much. So, <coughs> for that you may require some explicit control sometimes. So, we will look at flow control later on in some later lecture. Error detection, errors caused by signal attenuation, noise etcetera. So, receiver detects presence of errors that is error detection part. Now, once you detect that uh, there has been some error in this, uh, several things may happen. What uh, uh, first of all you may ask for some retransmission uh, from the other side, so that you can get the correct uh, data or uh, what uh, might happen in some cases at least in some limited uh, na cases. Uh, you might be able to look at that faulty data and correct it locally okay, without referring back to anybody or without uh, um, sort of uh, uh, any refer reference to the sending node you can do it locally at the receiving node. So, that is called error correction. So, we will look at that also. So, error detection and error correction receiver identifies and corrects the bit errors without resorting to retransmission. So, if that we can do that that is very good. And all these would happen on the line and the line could be uh, simplex, half duplex and full duplex. Uh, simplex uh, not very common uh, because simplex can go in only one direction half duplex or full duplex maybe half duplex and full duplex. With half duplex nodes at both ends uh, link can transmit, but not at the same time we know that. So, what are the kinds of services type of services that the uh, data link layer gives? One is unacknowledged connectionless. Uh, so, uh, no attempt to recover lost frames. If some frame is lost due to noise error etcetera etcetera there is no attempt to recover this because and there is no acknowledgement from the other side it is a connectionless system suited for low error rate networks or for fault tolerant applications such as voice. Uh, what we mean the, that the voice is a fault tolerant application? We mean uh, that even if some of the bits in a voice stream, digitized voice stream that is, uh, even if some of the bits uh, drop, uh, obviously there will be some degradation on the other side if you are, do, do not do, are not doing any kind of correction etcetera. But uh, to the human ear it may not be very perceptible. Okay. <coughs> For example, I am talking even if there is a momentary glitch you would more or less make out uh, what I am talking about alright. So, that is why in that sense it is very inherently fault tolerant. So, that is unacknowledgement unacknowledged connectionless service that is one kind of service. Acknowledged connectionless service this is another kind of service. So, each frame is acknowledged by the receiver. Uh, so, this is uh, suited for unreliable channel where uh, so, require this acknowledgement for special reliability. Acknowledged connection oriented service ensures that all frames are received and each is received exactly once and these services are accomplished using as I said simplex not usual, but half duplex or full duplex channel. So, this is some examples not very important uh, sorry. So, it is a reliable message stream. Uh, it, it may be connection oriented service or it may be connection less service. Uh, it may be a, a reliable message stream or reliable byte stream. So, reliable message stream sequence of pages, reliable, reliable byte stream let us say remote login. So, they are coming byte by byte. Here it is coming page by page. Unreliable connection like digital voice, unreliable datagram. So, these are about the, when you come to datagram this becomes connection less service, unreliable datagram acknowledge datagram, request reply etcetera. Now, uh, let us uh, look at uh, just uh, one thing that where does this all this data link layer ex exactly where does it exist. Physical medium we understand it is a cable or it is this uh, electromagnetic field this free space uh, etcetera or a fiber. Uh, so, we can see it we can feel it, but where does the data link layer 
reside so to say. Okay. So, usually they reside in the uh, so called network interface card. All right. uh, so, let us say if you have a PC uh, which is connected to a network uh, possibly it is connected through a uh, maybe ethernet uh, there is an ethernet card or something or ethernet NIC as they call it NIC for NIC that is network interface card and that network interface card has a socket where uh, your maybe ethernet cable will come and plug in. Similarly, uh, there may be uh, other kinds of <coughs> cards. So, there is a uh, network adapter is there. So, these adapters actually implement most of these uh, data link functions and it is actually these adapters which are com uh, which are communicate. So, let us say we have a datagram which is coming from a higher layer. This is uh, made into a frame by this adapter card and then this frame is sent uh, and this in sending it this is where the link layer protocol comes into the picture and reaches the destination. These are the two adapters. So, this is the sending node and the receiving node. So, as I said link layer implemented in adapter also known as NIC. Examples are ethernet card, PCMCI cards, uh, which may be there in let us say laptops and all 802.11 cards uh, which are used for let us say wireless LAN connection and things like that. So, on the sending side we encapsulate the datagram in a frame adds error correcting or checking bits RDT flow control etcetera and on the receiving side it looks for errors um, or flow control etcetera extracts datagram passes to the receiving node adapter is semi autonomous and communicates directly with link and physical layers. <coughs> so, it is basically the adapters uh, where most of these data link functionalities are. Uh, so, it that, that of course, means uh, that adapter will have some uh, hardware as well as maybe some inbuilt software. Uh, so, all that is there in that card. Now, we talk about two parts MAC and LLC. Uh, we have already seen about MAC. Actually, the data link layer is divided into two parts. Okay. One is the MAC and LLC as we will see. So, in any broadcast network MAC, we know the stations must ensure that only one station transmits at a time on the shared communication channel. Otherwise, they will collide and they will uh, become sort of garbled etcetera. So, this is the MAC part of it. The protocol that determines who can transmit on a broadcast channel are called medium access control protocol MAC protocol. We have seen a number of MAC protocol like TDMA, FDMA, CDMA uh, then uh, your uh, token based uh, MAC protocols and so on. We will see a few more in future actually. So, this is the part. So, we have this is the if this entire thing is the data link layer then this is uh, divided into two sub layers. So, above the data link layer as you see that is uh, to, to network layer and below it is the physical layer and the data link layer itself is divided into two parts. The medium access control plot part uh, which is the closer to the physical layer and the logical link control. We have already seen a number of MAC protocols. We will talk about LLC or logical link control today. So, the MAC protocol are implemented in the MAC sub layer uh, which is the lower sub layer of the data link layer. The higher portion of the data link layer is often called the logical link control or LLC. And this is the broad picture we have been referring to some um, numbers like 802.1234 etcetera. So, this is what the broad picture looks like. So, IEEE 802 is a family of standards for LANs which define an LLC and several MAC sub layers. So, you see 802.1 is some overview kind of thing. So, this sort of encompasses uh, uh, all these. 802.2 is the LLC part which we will be talking about now. And below the 802.2 we have various kinds of me, uh, medium access control. We have 802.3, 802.4, 5, 6 and uh, now we have 11, 15, 16 all kinds of there. So, the, all these are in the data link layer above this are the higher layers and below it are the physical layer. So, this is uh, some of the names uh, for the time being. So, 802.1 gives you an overview, 802.2 is the LLC that we will be talking about today. 802.3 is the famous Ethernet, CSMACD is the kind of MAC protocol that it uses, we will talk about that later. 
802.5 is the token bus which we have already seen, 802.5 is the token ring also seen, 802.6 is the distributed queue dual bus, FDDI is the fiber distributed data interface and there are others. Okay. Uh, as new MAC protocols and new systems come up, uh, so they keep on adding to this set of uh, standards etcetera. So, we will see a few more uh, later. So, we have this LLC sitting on top LLC sub layer sitting on top of the MAC sub layer. So, what does that mean in terms of headers and trailers? Well, for LLC whatever it does it requires some headers. So, the when the packet is coming from the network layer the LLC header is added to the packet. Uh, so, it will reach the LLC sub layer on the other side. Then it comes to the MAC sub layer and MAC sub layer uh, will add its header, it may add some trailer also and this MAC LLC and the original packet etcetera MAC the whole thing gets uh, I mean may, may be uh, constitute one frame and then it is pushed uh, onto the uh, physical layer uh, in the network. Okay. Uh, so, 802 lands offer a best effort data frame service. Error control and flow control are handled by LLC. LLC run on all three 802 LANs and hides the differences to the network layer. So, the, to the network layer, uh, these different um, physical layer protocols, whether it is a, a token bus or an Ethernet, etcetera, uh, th that is sort of transparent to the network layer. The network layer does not bother about it. The Mm, data link layer takes care of that. What the network layer knows is that this data link layer which is sitting below me is going to give me a sort of uh, as reliable as possible service for sending the data or the packet from this node to the next. Okay? So, that service is taken for granted by the network layer and it does not bother with all the <laughs> different complexities or all the uh, different variabilities which are there in the lower uh, layers. So, LLC adds its header as I showed to the network layer packet, it contains sequence and acknowledgement numbers it might, why we will see that uh, later. Resulting structure goes into the payload of 802.x frame for transmission. So, LLC operations uh, are uh, sometimes um, sort of divided in this fashion, we have a type 1 operation and type 2 operation and type 3 operation. So, type 1 operation supports unacknowledgement connectionless service, therefore the different services we have different types of operation, it uh, type 2 is connection mode service and type 3 supports acknowledged connectionless service etcetera. So, we will look at these. And for this LLC, uh, we have a PDU or the so called protocol data unit, all right. And this protocol data unit it carries information. So, use so in the, the it carries some uh, different parts and the different types of PDUs are there. So, uh, the information uh, this PDU, so it used to carry uh, user data. The control field includes a 7 bit sequence number associated with this PDU. It also includes a piggybacking acknowledgement sequence number. What is piggybacking of acknowledgement? We will discuss uh, later. Unnumbered, like various protocol control PDUs, these 5 bit M fields indicates uh, what kind of PDU it is. Then there are some supervisory PDUs used for flow and error control. It includes an acknowledgement and sequence number and a 2 bit uh, some fields are there receive ready, receive not ready and reject etcetera. These are used for the, this may be used uh, for some particular data link protocols. Um, so, type 1 operation we know what it is. The UI of uh, PDU uh, is used to transfer user data, there is no ACK flow control or error control. The XID and test PDU support management functions associated with all three types of operations that means type 1, type 2 and type 3 operations. So, these PDUs are used for any of these. So, an LLC entity may issue a command uh, XID or test, the receiving LLC entity issues a corresponding XID or test in response. So, uh, you please remember that even if you have an unacknowledged uh, data uh, that means 
connectionless kind of service, even then you will have to test the link, see that it is all right, see that the other side is operating and then only you can send all right. So, that part uh, that uh, uh, that uh, checking the link etcetera is still necessary whether you have a connection oriented service or a connectionless service. Type 2 operation support the connection mode service. So, type 2 operation involves three phases connection establishment, data transfer and connection termination. With type 3 operation which you remember is acknowledged connection oriented service. Uh, connection less service with type 3 operation each PDU transmitted is acknowledged. So, there is an acknowledgement coming from the other side. A new unnumbered PDU the acknowledged connection less uh, AC information PDU is defined because for this acknowledgement. User data are sent in uh, AC command PDUs and uh, um, AC command PDUs and must be acknowledged using an AC response PDU. So, we will uh, look at some detail of this later on. To guard against lost PDUs, some PDU which uh, the sender might have sent, uh, it may not have reached the destination all right. So, uh, if it does not reach the destination, so it may be lost. Now, why it does not reach the destination, maybe the link failed uh, momentarily, may, maybe momentarily there was a noise burst which sort of garbled the data completely etcetera. For various reasons the data may uh, get uh, lost on the way. So, you have to make that worst case assumption. So, to guard against lost PDU since this is a more reliable kind of operation type 3 operation a 1 bit sequence number is used we will see how this is used later on. The sender alternates the use of 0 and 1 in this 1 bit. Uh, so, how that helps we will see and the receiver responds with an AC PDU with the opposite number of the corresponding command only one PDU in each direction may be outstanding at any time. So, now let us come to some of the details first we will discuss framing uh -huh. and then we will look at uh, some of the way uh, things are transferred. Now, uh, frame synchronization okay. um, that is the uh, two sides uh, must be uh, able to synchronize uh, their operation. Um, this synchronization may be of various type ok. Uh, this uh, suppose you are sending just one bit uh, one, uh, one uh, byte or one, um, uh, one byte at a time. Now, at that byte level uh, you have to synchronize or you are sending a series of uh, blocks ok uh, each block containing a number of bytes all right you are ca carrying them. Now, wh where does one block start where does it end etcetera etcetera. So, all this synchronization a higher level synchronization is also necessary. So, frame synchronization is necessary when data are transferred from the transmitter to the receiver unless steps are taken to provide synchronization the receiver may start interpreting the data erroneously ok. Suppose, you have taken the um, first uh, say the uh, second byte as the first byte uh, you will never know that you have lost the first byte anyway all right. Now, two common approaches are there one is asynchronous transmission and the other is synchronous transmission. So, we will look at both of these this is asynchronous transmission data are transmitted one character at a time this is what I was talking about say an asynchronous transmission timing or synchronization must only be maintained within each character and of course, here the receiver has the opportunity to resynchronize at the beginning of each new character all right. So, if you uh, use some kind of coding like let us say if you remember from our discussion uh, about how uh, data is encoded digitally. So, if you are using Manchester encoding so that there is definitely a transition in the middle of the bit uh, then <coughs> you can use that transition time to synchronize between the receiving and the uh, uh, sending and the receiving uh, nodes. So, such synchronization is possible. So, when no character is being transmitted the line between transmitter and receiver is an idle state. So, uh, it is an idle state. So, there must be some start uh, and some stop ok. So, this is the start of a sequence of characters the data are going. Uh, and then we may add some parity bits we will later see what parity bits are and then uh, the uh, transmission stops. So, there is a start 
uh, parity and stop bits. In synchronous transmission here a block of bits is transmitted in a steady stream without start and stop codes. Actually, uh, the I mean in terms of efficiency asynchronous transmission is not uh, that efficient. So, if you are just sending very small amount of just one or a few characters then asynchronous transmission may be all right, but when you are doing a lot of transfer all right in that case uh, you need to I mean asynchronous transmission becomes very inefficient. So, for the purpose of efficiency we need to uh, go for the synchronous transmission where uh, we send uh, a number of blocks each block containing a number of characters. So, here a block of bits is transmitted in a steady stream without start and end uh, or start and stop codes. The block may be arbitrarily long it may be to prevent timing drift between the transmitter and receiver clock signal is embedded in the data signal for example, using Manchester encoding. Now, apart from this uh, synchronization of clock uh, for the bit uh, where does the bit uh, start and end in or especially the middle uh, apart from that you require another level of synchronization. So, as to allow the receiver to determine the beginning and end of a block of data. So, this for synchronization we require this. So, we need to uh, sort of say that this well this is where the uh, data begins and this is where the data ends. Every block begins with a preamble bit pattern and generally ends with a postamble bit pattern. That means, for each block it starts with a preamble bit pattern that is the start of the block and then the block goes and then there will be some part at the end which is the postamble. Now, the how what kind of preamble or what kind of postamble would be there would depend very much on what kind of protocol what kind of data link protocol is running all right. Uh, so, different protocols have some uh, all will be having different headers and different trailers or some may not be having any trailer at all. So, here I give some examples uh, I mean you need not uh, remember all this, uh, <coughs> but this is just to show you for example, deck nets uh, these are the some frames. So, okay, some so it is it is this whole uh, accepting the body you see that the body is the part which came down from above that means from the network layer the rest of it all this header uh, the uh, part which is coming in the beginning and the part which is coming in the end CRC etcetera and they are uh, they have been added at uh, this layer. So, deck nets uh, DDCMP frame looks like this ATM cells they ha just have a header CRC and a body then IBMs have had some biasing frame ARPANET IMP IMP frame. So, this is sort of uh, obsolete now. ISO's HDLC frame HDLC we will look at details of HDLC later on this looks like this uh, some specific pattern bit pattern then some header then the body then CRC and then again some specific pattern. So, a typical synchronous frame format would have 8 bit flag which would be the preamble then maybe some control fields data fields uh, and then maybe again some control fields and then some 8 bit flag at the post amble. Now, for sizable blocks of data synchronous transmission is far more efficient than asynchronous mode. Asynchronous transmission requires 20 percent or more of overhead okay, it has a lot of overhead. The control information preamble and postamble in synchronous transmission are typically less than 100 bits actually the overhead is much less here. So, the efficiency of synchronous transmission is very high. So, that is why I said that when you are sending a lot of data uh, you would usually go for uh, synchronous transmission which is more common. So, um, now let us look at the specific these things of uh, specific um, issue of framing translates the physical layers uh, raw bit stream into discrete units called frames. So, sender is uh, sending and the receiver is receiving sender has sent frame 1 frame 2 to frame n. So, you see n frames are on transit and it is going from the sender to the receiver. Now, how can the receiver detect the frame boundaries okay. that is how can the receiver recognize the start and end of a frame. There are four methods length count bit stuffing character or byte stuffing or pulse encoding. So, we will look at uh, uh, some of these now. 
Now, frames could be fixed length like ATM all right. Mm, so, ATM cells are a fixed length. So, you know once you have synchronized you know that um, uh, they are going to come with uh, in a 53 byte kind of uh, uh, regularity, but uh, frames could be variable length also in which case we use this byte count, uh, byte stuffing, bit stuffing, generic framing procedure, Manchester encoding etcetera. <coughs> one is the framing the length count make the first field. So, this is the make the first field in the frames header be the length of the frame that way the receiver knows how big the current frame is and can determine when the uh, uh, this frame ends. So, if you have a uh, uh, frame 1 uh, is uh, 5 characters. So, if you write 5 over here. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 characters. So, you know that this is where the first uh, frame has ended and the next one uh, say the sixth byte is to be interpreted as uh, the length of the next frame which is again 5 and then this one is a frame of length 8 and so on. So, you know where each frame uh, uh, star uh, uh, ends and the next frame starts. But this has a disadvantage. Uh, so, which is that uh, receiver loses synchronization when bits become garbled. If the bits in the count become corrupted during transmission, the receiver will think that the frame contains fewer or more bits than it actually does. Okay. Now, this is a uh, problem in the sense that uh, when you are um, uh, sending them suppose due to some error etcetera the um, count field itself has become garbled. Now, there is a receiver does not know how many bits are there. So, it may make some assumption which may be a wrong assumption. So, now it will interpret some other byte which is a part of something else may be data may be some other control field or whatever as the length of the next frame etcetera. So, once it loses sync, so everything starts getting garbled. So, this is a disadvantage and this is one reason why this is not uh, used much. Uh, you can use a checksum. Uh, so, you can use a checksum. So, we will later on see what a checksum is. We will detect the incorrect frames. The receiver will have difficulty resynchronizing to the start of a new frame. So, this technique is not used anymore since better techniques are available. So, one of the better techniques is known as bit stuffing. Okay. Suppose, so use reserved bit patterns to indicate the start and end of a frame. For instance, use the 4 bit sequence of 0 1 1 1 to delimit consecutive frames. A frame consists of everything between 2 delimiters. So, you have this uh, 1 delimiter on one side 0 triple 1 and then the frame and then the uh, other uh, 0 1 1. So, this uh, as soon as you get a 0 1 1 you know that a frame is starting and as soon as you get another 0 1 1 you know that a frame has ended. So, this way we can uh, know the beginning of the end of a frame. Okay. Uh, well, uh, obviously I do not know whether that is obvious, but there is a problem with this. Problem is what happens if the reserved delimiter happens to appear in the frame itself. If you do not remove it from the data the receiver will think that the incoming frame is actually two smaller frames. So, you understand the problem is very simple uh, suppose this we have the 0 1 1 uh, 1 as the delimiter, but the data itself may contain uh, that means data which has come may be from the user. Okay. This may contain any bit pattern and actually you have to allow uh, uh, um, any and every bit pattern uh, to the user you cannot say that you cannot send the 0 1 1 1 1. Uh, because uh, it may be uh, some uh, some may be picture is being sent through a number of frames and uh, it may the bit patterns may be absolutely arbitrary. So, in that case 0 or triple 1 may very well uh, appear in the body of the um, body of the data. Uh, so, this is where that bit stuffing part comes what we do is that we introduce another kind of pattern let us say the same 0 triple 1 uh, for each 0 triple 1 which appears inside which means that for the um, um, preamble and the uh, for the preamble on the that the beginning and the end we use this 0 triple 1 and this 0 triple 1 this unit appears singly at these two places. In the body of the frame 
if 0 triple 1 needs to appear instead of 1 0 triple 1 we put in 2 0 triple 1s. So, if the receiving end sees 2 0 triple 1s uh, one after the other it knows that the um, it actually is bit stuffing and it will reduce it to only 1 0 triple 1 in the body all right. Whereas, the preamble and the post ample will appear separately. So, the solution is to use bit stuffing within the frame after every occurrence of two consecutive ones insert a 0. This is another example of a bit stuffing. Okay. So, after every um, if there is a consecutive one two consecutive ones insert a 0. For example, append a 0 bit after each pair of ones in the data. This prevents the three consecutive ones from ever appearing in the frame. So, some bits have been introduced after every two ones in the um, data we insert a 0 and the receiver knows that if I encounter two ones and uh, uh, then uh, I, uh, then there is a 0, this 0 is actually a bit stuffing. So, this 0 will be dropped from the actual data. So, this way uh, these three ones will never appear in the uh, body of the uh, frame <coughs> whereas, it will appear in the uh, preamble and the post amble. Similar to bit stuffing, we may have byte stuffing. For example, let us say a flag uh, say some uh, some character uh, is there. Uh, so, uh, like say flag which is also a part of the which may be a part of a regular header, but this just happened to appear in the body of the uh, frame uh, or body of the packet. So, what we do is that we use this other character. So, that is why these are uh, character introduction. So, that is why it is called byte stuffing one byte is one character. Uh, so, we uh, introduce the character escape character just before the flag. And what happens if escape itself appears in the body? Well, we put escape escape. Uh, so, if there are two escapes side by side, we know that we have to interpret it as only one escape. If there were two escapes in the uh, original data packet uh, just by chance, then actually this will be uh, what will be sent are four escapes and uh, oh, just one after the other and the receiving side for each two escape it will reduce it to one escape and know that this is the just a part of the data. Only at the end uh, that we will uh, um, we will uh, get this uh, flag etcetera by itself. Okay. If there is escape flag we have escape 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 flag escape escape and, and so on. Okay. So, this is known as byte stuffing. All right. So, uh, we have sort of done a general discussion. So, what I am going to do now is to discuss a very uh, simple kind of protocol uh, which is used quite often known as point to point protocol. So, this is another example protocol that we will be uh, uh, using. It uses some of the stuff that we have uh, done till now and then we will go on to other parts of uh, this LLC. So, we will be discussing point to point protocol. So, point to point protocol will have uh, some, uh, so it will send things like this. So, there will be a flag, okay. uh, so we will just discuss the details of this later on. So, there will be a flag field, address field, control field, protocol field, payload. This payload is the one which is actually coming from the higher layers that means from the network layer and some of it will actually come from the user from the application layer itself. So, this is the payload. So, far as data link layer is concerned, then some checksum uh, and some it ends with a flag. So, this is what the general things looks like, uh, what exactly they are usually and how they are used, I am coming to that. So, in a point to point data link control, we have one sender, one receiver, one link. Okay. So, this is the uh, this is the main one thing that there is one sender. Uh, one receiver and there is only one link. So, in effect there is no question of any uh, media access control that MAC part is not very relevant over here because it is not a shared medium is just uh, from a this is just a point to point link. So, that is one good thing. So, we do not require any media access control and no need for explicit MAC addressing that is not required because there is no question of any address whatever you are sending from uh, the receiver side uh, it is just uh, destined for that other side that is a point to point protocol. Okay. 
and then uh, and examples are of course dial up links which many people use ISDN lines. So, these are all point to point link when you are using a dial up link for connecting your computer from a remote location actually that is a point to point link your computer is uh, uh, sort of getting directly connected to the computer on the other side there is nothing else. So, popular point to point DLC protocols are PPP point to point protocol which we are discussing HDLC which I will discuss later high level data link control. So, data link used to be considered high layer uh, in protocol stack earlier now it has become very uh, common. So, uh, so, PPP design requirements these are given in RFC <coughs> 1557. By the way, I do not remember whether I mentioned this earlier, this business about RFC, which is very, very important in the field of uh, uh, in the field of networking. RFC stands for request for comment. So, what uh, is happening is that suppose somebody has got an idea, well it goes to various stages, I am not going into the details of those stages, but at some particular point of time some particular protocol or some particular system etcetera they become widely accepted and they get coded into some RFC. And if you want to know the exact technical details of something uh, in the network field if you know the RFC number um, go to the website and uh, get the download the corresponding RFC they are all freely downloadable. So, you can read them and you can get all the details of any of these protocols uh, systems etcetera that are used in the network. Now, this particular uh, um, uh, for PPP design requirements were frozen in this RFC 1557. One thing is that it uses packet framing for packet frame. So, these are the requirements. So, it has to frame the packet encapsulation of network layer datagram in data link frame carry network layer data of any network layer protocol. So, that is one thing. So, then the network layer in once again just as in the MAC layer we have seen that a number of protocols are possible and then now we are looking at a number of protocols in the upper layer that uh, upper sub layer that LLC layer also. Similarly, in the network layer also different alternative protocols may be possible. So, PPP has to support all this. So, ability to demultiplex upwards. So, what is meant by demultiplexing? What is this demultiplexing? So, this is the uh, main thing that it is supporting uh, this different uh, network layer protocols at the same time. Suppose there are two network layer protocols uh, P 1 and P 2, okay. both of them are using the same link and both of them are using the same point to point link. So, it is using the point to point protocol. So, the both of them will send it to PPP. So, uh, that is uh, they, they will get somehow multiplexed and sent on the other side on the receiving side uh, by taking it, it uh, the receiving node uh, the that, that PPP system it will uh, get something it will know whether it is meant for P 1 or protocol P 1 on the network layer or protocol P 2 for the network layer. So, it is separating out. So, this demultiplexing this has to be possible this is one of the requirements. The other requirement is bit transparency which we have talked about which must always be there that means it must carry any bit pattern in the data field. So, whatever you may decide as your flag etcetera, but finally the all those bit patterns may appear in the data that is always possible. We require only error detection no correction at the receiving end that is another point. So, we need only error detection connection liveness we must be able to detect signal uh, link failure to network layer. So, we must be able to detect whether the connection is live or not if it is not live then we must be able to uh, give that I mean give that information to network layer. So, network layer may decide to send its data through using some other channel. Network layer address negotiation. So, endpoint can learn or configure each other's network address etcetera that is also. So, these are all part of PPP design requirements non requirements means these are not actually called for. So, no error correction or recovery we have mentioned this no flow control. So, here it is assumed that whatever the sender is sending the receiver can absorb that. So, there is no explicit flow control um, out of order delivery is ok that means you do not care if your uh, packets are going uh, or reaching the destination out of order all right. Uh, of course, if you are sending it through a particular transmission line uh, just one link they are not likely to get out of order, but anyway 
PPP is now even if it does because of some strange reason uh, PPP is not worried about it. No need to support multi point links. So, that is also not in its agenda at all it is just point to point. Error recovery flow control data reordering if they are necessary they are relegated to higher layers. So, now just look at this uh, once again and see what it does first one is this flag. So, this flag 0 triple 1 triple 1 0. So, this is the flag which uh, which shows the beginning of the frame and the same pattern shows the end of the frame. Okay. So, they are the delimiter for framing. Address this address is actually meaningless over here because <coughs> sorry uh, you know that as I mentioned since this is the PPP link. Uh, whatever you are sending pumping from one end it will reach only one destination on the other end. So, there is no uh, necessity for having a separate address field. So, address field is just used uh, all once does not really serve much of a purpose. Control field also at the moment does not uh, was kept over there because if it is used for some extending this protocol somehow uh, later. Uh, so, the, the so this field was there control field uh, once again this is not used protocol this is used because upper layer protocol to which frame delivered because whatever frame is coming this is when for uh, which protocol you remember we were talking about that example that in the network layer two different protocols are running uh, p1 and p2 and both of them are using the same ppp in that case uh, on the receiving end by getting a frame uh, you should know that whether this frame is meant for the P1 protocol which is running at the upper layer or the P2 protocol which is running at the upper layer both of them are running concurrently. Okay. And then this check this is for some the error detection part how this check is done that we will see in the next lecture and the end delimiter. Uh, so, uh, some in the data frame some info that is upper layer data being carried or check is the cycling redundancy check for uh, check for error. So, info is the upper layer data. So, this is the bo uh, main body uh, or the payload which is being uh, carried check is for error detection. It uses byte stuffing you see that uh, 0 uh, 6 1 and 0 which is the flag. Um, uh, so, this is 1 byte. So, this is 8 bits that is 1 byte is received now. So, the question is is received uh, this same pattern is it, is it data or is it flag. Well, sender adds or stuffs extra uh, 0 111110 uh, byte after each such pattern. Uh, so, data byte. So, uh, if it is if had it been a part of uh, data then instead of getting one such pattern you would get two such consecutive patterns whereas, if it is occurring singly that means that is a uh, frame delimiter. So, two uh, such patterns in a row discard first byte continue data reception single uh, uh, this thing means it is a flag byte. So, this is the one. So, in the inside the data you have this pattern the same thing I have shown. So, uh, after PPP instead of it, it will send the first uh, this um, B 1 then B 2 uh, 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 etcetera and then instead of sending one of them 0 1 1 1 0 it sends two of them and then B 4 and B 5. Okay. So, this is the byte stuffing which is used by PPP, uh, but uh, and there are a few control issues like before exchanging network layer data, data like link pairs must configure PPP link maximum frame length authentication etcetera. Uh, so, we have a uh, we have I think this is a better diagram. So, we can look at this. So, the first the link may be dead then uh, the carrier is detected. So, it will try to establish the link for that they will require some authentication uh, that means, the two sides configurations etcetera they, that must agree. If it fails to establish then it goes back to dead if it gets successful authentication is successful then of course, uh, um, the network it is open and then uh, there is some uh, transmission of data and then finally, it will terminate. So, for all these there is uh, data exchange we need not go into the details of this. So, configuration configure request configure acknowledgement configure not acknowledgement that means, you have configured this thing is not acknowledged some of the options are not accepted 
and some of the options are not negotiable. So, this way the two sides uh, communicate and establish the link, we need not go into the details, this is not really necessary. So, uh, this, is a, this is a very simple protocol, just use byte stuffing and you use this uh, some data, some error detection and the framing, okay. that is all. So, this is a very simple, but very widely used uh, um, protocol. In the next lecture, we will look at the details of how this error detection and error control can be done by the data link layer. Thank you. Good day. So, <coughs> in the uh, last lecture, we have seen some uh, functionalities of the data link layer namely framing etcetera. And we had been uh, talking uh, off and on about that error control, uh, that is error control means error detection, correction etcetera. Uh, so, we will be talking about error detection, correction in this lecture. So, we will be talking about error control now. Now, data errors. When data is transmitted over a cable or a channel, there is always a chance that some of the bits will be changed or corrupted due to noise, signal distortion or attenuation etcetera. Okay. So, so many things may happen. For example, suppose you have a um, wireless channel uh, and, and suddenly there is a burst of noise. Okay. So, what will happen is that some of the data will get garbled. Similarly, the data may have go, become very attenuated may be due to some loose contact somewhere or something and then uh, uh, one that was sent was not uh, received that way or maybe it was received as a, one, a 0 or something. So, uh, uh, whenever you are sending some uh, data or something there is some communication going on, some transmission over some transmission line, you always have to assume that uh, data may not uh, go uh, uh, I mean reach the other side in a perfect condition. So, that is why CRC is uh, um, uh, preferred in many uh, data link uh, protocols. So, what is this CRC? So, let us just look at the details of it. Essentially, the data is regarded as being one very long binary number. After all, what you are sending is a string of 1s and zeros. So, you can take a few of them and just look at it as a binary number, although the original intention of the uh, user or the, I mean if you are adding the header also then it got even more mixed up. Uh, I mean it was not to be interpreted as a number, but for CRC purpose we interpret it as a uh, um, uh, binary number anyway, as we will see uh, later on uh, and uh, so we will uh, continue our discussion on this error control uh, and then we will go move on to flow control etcetera in the next lecture. Um, so, this is a simple kind of protocol, but this has got efficiency problem in the sense that this is not very efficient. Okay. So, we will continue this discussion in the next lecture. Thank you.